Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast, dedicated to the Holy Family. I'm Thomas V. Miras. Today I'm speaking with Obiano Dugakeocha about how Western governments and non-governmental organizations are pushing abortion in African countries. It's probably no surprise to you to hear that uh, Western governments and corporations and nonprofits have often been engaged in attempting to foist a sexual revolution on more traditional societies. But the degree to which population control dominates development aid is still shocking. My guest today is an international speaker who raises awareness about this issue. She's the founder of Culture of Life Africa, the author of a book and a recent documentary on the topic of the sort of neocolonialism, or as Pope Francis has called it, ideological colonization, in which the West attempts to export abortion into other countries, whether they like it or not. And as you'll hear in this interview, there are certain so-called family planning organizations which even perform abortions in countries in Africa where it is illegal. Obianuju Akiocha, welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Did I get that right? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Thomas. <laughs> Thank you for having me on your podcast. No problem. Okay, so I watched your documentary, Strings Attached, recently, and I understand that there's a book that you wrote by the same title. It's not the same title, but it's kind of the same sort of similar theme. The book is called Target Africa. Target Africa. And I think, it, yeah, and Target Africa covers sort of a broader sense, covers things in a broader sense. And then the documentary goes, as you saw, it really goes to the people to, to get interviews and get their voices specifically. So the book is Target Africa. The documentary is Strings Attached. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> so it's interesting. I noticed that the documentary, which is about the use of foreign aid by Western countries to push abortion and contraception on African countries, it is not so much about the morality of abortion as it is about the women. I mean, of course, the babies are important, but it, it seemed as though your emphasis in the documentary was about speaking to these individual women who have been affected by this and also to get a sense of what the attitudes of African women are towards abortion. So maybe we could start there at the risk of generalization. Is it possible to generalize about the attitude that your average African woman has towards abortion? Yes, absolutely, Thomas. It's, it's very possible. And I, I mean, this was one of the things that worried me a bit when I started this work, because I felt, well, Africa is an entire continent. There are so many tribes, there are so many different subcultures within the continent of Africa, different kinds of people. So it, it was really hard for me to take that giant step, you know, to start talking about it in terms of Africa, you know, or the African people. But I, I was very much reassured having traveled through different African countries and spoken to so many people in different parts of society. So people who are very much educated within academic setting in African schools, universities, secondary schools, higher institutions, within government agencies. I've also spoken to a lot of people in the villages, in the towns, you know, people who are doing different types of work within society just to get a feel of what people are talking about and how they feel about, you know, the issue of abortion. So that is the one thing is my field experience in various African countries, as well as some of the polls that have come out. It's not all the time that, that polls are done on the issue of abortion, but it has been done in the past. Pew Research a couple of years ago did a very robust survey, and they found out that in most of the African countries that were surveyed, upwards of 80% of the people were saying that they were against abortion. So I am basing my work and the way I speak about abortion in Africa or abortion and Africa. I'm basing it on both experience as well as, you know, hard data and facts that I've seen from various sources. So it's not a bad generalization to say that the average African is against abortion. There is at least a strong 70 to 80 percent of the people in various countries that are against abortion, as well as the nations themselves. That's another way of judging it. There are 55 African countries in Africa, and of the 55 countries, 
Four countries have what you would call abortion on demand. So that still means that in general, about 80% of the entire continent of Africa has refused to legalize abortion. I so in, in whatever way we look at it, the African continent, I can confidently call it a very pro-life continent. I see. And now for those who aren't familiar with you, what, what country are you from? I am from Nigeria and Nigeria is in West Africa, is just by the that is news, but by the coast of the Atlantic Ocean. It's a big country, it's the most populous country in Africa, and you know, very much amazing people. <laughs> and I'm from the Igbo <laughs> tribe, so I'm from the southeastern part of Nigeria. I see. Now you covered the legality question already. So Perhaps we can just start with the big picture. In the documentary, you mention a 2014 report by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which gives us a sense of how much in recent years, Western donors, I'm assuming both public and private, have given Africa for various funds, including healthcare, education, water, sanitation, and what they would call family planning, birth control, abortion. And what is the sort of the proportion of birth control and family planning funding, I mean that in the euphemistic sense, in relation to these other things that, you know, Catholics would be in favor of. Right. So the OECD, you've already mentioned it, is this organization that many people don't know about is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. But it's a very important organization because it's they're kind of in the background. And the only reason they exist is to track what is happening with development aid. So what we'll call foreign aid or humanitarian aid. They are tracking it. Uh, they are checking what one country gives to another. They have these countries that are the donor nations and they fall under this thing they call the DAC, the Development Assistance Committee Nations. And there are about 30 countries there. And yes, the United States is part of it. Yes, the United Kingdom is part of it. Most of the large Western countries are part of it. So the OECD then tracks everything that goes through these aid channels. And then the important part of their work, I think, is that they track even up to the the various sectors that are funded. It's not just a matter of the United States gave this, you know, 100 million to this country, but they would check what the 100 million was for, you know, what went to education, what went to healthcare, what went to infrastructure and, you know, and so on and so forth. So I have studied very carefully a lot of the data and statistics that have come from the OECD. And the most telling, and I'd say even like the most current is 2014, because believe it or not, they're very slow in, you know, bringing out their records. So 2014 is about the most current data that we have. But the good thing is that when you're looking at the 2014 records, it goes all the way back to 1996. So you would have a cumulative feel of what has happened and you see a graph of what has happened. So you were asking about what proportion of money goes to what you call the population program. So the population programs, of course, would include abortion, contraception, uh, sexuality, education, but it's different from health. And I'm always very pleased to see that they've separated it from health so that we can know exactly what goes where. So at the moment, or rather in 1996, when this tracking began, or this kind of comparative tracking began, population program was the lowest. It wasn't one of the lowest. It was, in fact, the very lowest part of the foreign aid project. So what I mean by that is that of everything that was being given to African nations, the population program, so the condoms, contraception, abortion money, the money that was going to organizations like International Planned Parenthood Federation and Mary Soaps International was the least. Education was more than it. Healthcare, you know, more priority was given to all these other important issues. But then all of a sudden, if you are looking at the graph, you see it really rising very quickly. By It was about 2009 that everything flipped, that population program money then surpassed everything. It just went all the way from being the lowest fund amount of funds given, it became the highest amount of funds given. So it exceeded education funds and, you know, money given for government and civil society, you know, and all of these things. 
But the interesting thing is that it still remained the very highest fund given up to 2014. So nothing else has passed it up until then. I don't know what has now happened. I mean, since President Donald Trump came into office, maybe that would change because the United, what United States gives in aid affects the entire amount of money given in aid because the U.S. is the highest donor within the DAC. So population programs have superseded everything. And from yet to year, you're asking what proportion of money goes there from year to year. It changes really. But I'll give you an example. There was a year that the United States of America gave to African nations of everything it was given, about 30% of everything, every money it was given was just for population. And then everything else was split, you know, while education was getting something like 5% of the entire funding, population program was getting a huge 30%. There was also a year the United Kingdom gave to Africa about 40%, almost 50%, if I was more than 40%, almost 50% of all the money that they gave to African nations were classified on the population program. So it's really shocking to see when it's all split down, what is given to Africa. But another thing to note is that there are also other parts of the developing world that get money. Africa is not the only one that would get money from the donor nation. So you have Southeast Asia and you have Latin America and even you have parts of Oceania. So smaller countries there like Timor-Leste and the Fiji and, and all of that, those countries get money as well. Now, if you check, if you go down and check the same data that I'm telling you about, it's interesting to find that population program still till today remains the least amount of money. So this kind of a massive increase in population program seems to have been a special selection of Africa, particularly because the way the graph went up is not exactly how it has happened with the donor money that has gone into Asia and Latin America and East Asia and as well as the Oceanias. So I think Africa has been targeted in, in a very specific way, but most people don't see it because a lot of this data is quite hard to see. And track. Do you think that's because Africa is more high profile as a recipient of aid or is there something else going no. on there? No, I think I think it's because they think they have been raising a lamb that African population is going so high and you know it's actually in my book where I quite explain how you know reproduction and the birth rate and fertility rate, how it has gone. Uh, fertility rate, as you know, is going quite down in, in many parts of Asia. It's going down in Latin America. But they keep complaining that Africa has a, a very high population. So I think it's a specific targeted program, population control program, which they're not really saying, but each year they just turn up with more money for condoms and more money for contraception, and nobody is really asking why. Mm. So what are the organizations we should focus on here and how much of their money comes from governments? Yes. So there are a couple of organizations that I have been tracking particularly. And in the documentary Strings Attached, the organization that I kind of zoom into the affair is this organization called Marie Stopes International. Marie Stopes International is a massive, massive abortion abortion organization that has originated from the United Kingdom. It was founded by Marie Stopes, who is also a contemporary of Margaret Sanger, believe it or not. So she operated in the 1920s from about the 1920s and 30s. She was a well-known eugenicist in the United Kingdom. She was also a botanist, but she had very, very similar views as Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. So now she founded this organization, Marie Stopes, which has, of course, she has now left behind as her, as her legacy. And Marie Stopes is performing about a third of the abortions in the United Kingdom as it is. Now, the thing is that whereas Marie Stopes is performing about a third of the abortions in the UK, the most of the abortion work is done as, quote unquote, development work. So Marie Stopes has specialized in kind of branding their work as development, you know, projects. So they've gone into developing countries as a development type organization. So that's how they have come through in their branding. So in so doing, by branding themselves as a, an organization that is 
very much into development, they have now tapped into that well of gold that is the donor money, right? The one that we've been talking about, all this money that we've talked about. I explained to you how it's all been allocated. Because Marie Stoops has branded themselves as a development type reproductive rights organization, they've tapped into that wealth and they are taking or getting a lot of money through it. They get a lot of money from foreign governments, not just they get a lot from the United Kingdom kingdom, but not just the UK. It's very shocking to many of my American friends when I tell them that they have funded Marie Stopes throughout the Obama administration. They, you know, people didn't realize this, but the United States was the second highest donor to Marie Stopes International, this abortion organization, throughout, you know, from the 2008, 2009, 2000, this whole time that President Obama was there. And what made it possible was the Mexico City policy, which he collapsed or which he completed completely removed and that allowed him to give money to this organization. Now Maristops goes into African nations as development type organization, women's health, women's rights, but what they really do in these countries as the documentary will show is uh, as abortion. You know, they are really about the business of abortion. But mind you, as I said at the beginning of this conversation of ours, most of African countries don't even have legal abortion. So about 80% of Africa African nations have refused to legalize abortion. However, Marie Stopes International stays in place in those countries. They say they're doing family planning, but they are doing a lot more than family planning. They are aborting babies. They are offering people abortions. They are also doing a lot of background work in working the, you know, and trying to lead the leaders within these countries towards legalized abortion. So they're providing resources for advocacy as well. So in other words, mind you, this is a foreign organization, a British organization in developing countries, doing a lot of background work, lobbying highly placed officials, government officials, and trying to get abortion legalized so they can have an entirely, you know, new market for abortions. But Even when that hasn't worked, they still are doing abortions in these countries, but they are very much a government-funded agency in in so many ways because so many Western countries get to give them money as part of development aid. Do you have any sense of a percentage of Marie Stopes funding, how much of that would come from governments? I think they get about half. So they get about a hundred million pounds, according to their annual report, about a hundred million pounds that they call a grant income. So their grant income is just free money. That's money that has come from government agencies, but they are a fairly small organization. So they run on about $330 million. So about a half of a good half of all their money comes from government. And the rest of it comes from hardcore business. So when they go to these countries and they perform abortions, they're still taking money anyway. So they're generating a lot of funds by the abortions they do. But then they get about half of what they use in their work from various foreign and Western governments. So they're a bit smaller than Planned Parenthood, apparently. They are absolutely. Planned Parenthood is in 42 sub-Saharan African countries, so they're mostly everywhere. But Marie Stopes has a much smaller operation, but they are doing a lot more abortions than Planned Parenthood. So Planned Parenthood reports, the International Planned Parenthood Federation is reporting about 1.1 million abortions and abortion-related services at the end of every year globally. So plus what they do in America, plus what they do everywhere else, they are reporting about 1.1 million abortions a year, you know, which is a kill. It's a massive amount of of abortions. Now, Mm. Marie Stokes, which is a smaller organization, is reporting 3.6 million abortions and abortion-related services every year. (laughs) And existing in only 16 African countries. So that means, you know, and of the 3.6 million 70,000 of those are from the abortion practices in the UK. That means there's a whole 3 million, 3 point something million that they are killing, you know, somewhere. They only have 37 countries that they're operating in. They are really, really at it, aborting babies, because most of the countries where, a lot of the countries where they exist don't even have legal abortion. Wow. Okay, so let's move on to that. Perhaps we can, I I believe you focused a lot on Marie Stopes International's activities in Kenya, right? In the documentary. How, how How do they go about 
running these illegal abortion clinics in Kenya? So they're all set up everywhere. They're both in Kenya and Uganda and even Nigeria and other places. But the documentary, as you say, I concentrated on Kenya and I also did some work in Uganda with some of the quote unquote family planning practices that are also quite unethical. However, what they do when they come to a place, they settle in and they come in, they come in and settle in as a family planning organization, reproductive rights organization. They set up clinics, usually in the capital cities of the countries where they exist. But then from those capital cities, they then have what they call their mobile clinics. And that's why I think they can have such a wide reach because I don't know if you've been to Africa Africa is much more developed than people think. But then the thing is that there is still a lot of Africa that will go under the classification of rural areas. So there are many places within various countries where it's not very accessible. So if you see what I mean, there are people in villages where for you to get there, you need a four wheel drive, for example, you know, it's not all that easy to get to the people. However, Marie Stokes has enough money for them to get everything they need to reach into these villages. They set up their mobile clinics, which only run for a short period of time. They do their dirty business there and then they leave and go to another part of the country or another village or rural area. Now, the problem with this is that because these are very hard to reach areas. There is absolutely no oversight. They answer to no one. They get there, they do what they want to do, and they walk away. So there are a lot of terrible things that happen that for you to even find out that Marie Stokes has you know, devastated or or destroyed so many people's lives, you too have to be able to get access to get to those villages. And sometimes that is uh, quite a hard task. So this is what they do. They have their major clinics or their major branches within the bigger cities. And then from there, they run mobile clinics throughout the country. There's also something else that they're doing in some countries, which I have found to be the case in Kenya, in Ethiopia. So when they get into a country... There may be some kind of very basic, you know, health care centers or or small women's clinics and things like that. So those who show interest, I mean, they actually co-opt these smaller clinics and get them to rebrand and become like a, almost like a subsidiary, if that could make sense. So they take over structures, smaller structures of, of uh, smaller basic health care centers and make them principally abortion centers. So in Kenya, they are called the Amoa Clinic. So a clinic that exists, maybe a private clinic being run by some doctor, if they come to some agreement with Marie Stokes, Marie Stokes will come in and give them money, give them funding, give them what they need to then be transformed into reproductive rights or reproductive health centers. So these are places maybe where lives could have been saved before, maybe where you know real health care could have been given. But because these are also clinics, clinics that need money. Marisa comes around, they are the only ones that come around. They come with a lot of funding and they are able to kind of take over these subsidiary clinics, train them up and make them little abortion centers. In Ethiopia, they're using also a very similar marketing strategy. This is how they're able to multiply themselves and clone themselves in whatever country that they exist. So to what degree are they attempting to conceal this? And if so, how do they do that? Well, they are concealing it. <laughs> they are concealing it because, you know, if, you know, for example, if they're doing abortions in a country where abortion is not legal, they already are in very dangerous, you know, quarters because they are already in illegal practice. So most times when they have their staff, the staff, they're part of this, right? Once they get into this, they find out this is an abortion, you know, this is an abortion practice. Is either you leave or you stay and become part of this whole illegal cartel or whatever it is that they do. So what you find is that because of poverty and because of difficulty and unemployment rates, people find it quite difficult to leave Marista. It's not because they like it, but because they are stuck in it and they feel that there's no place else that they can go and get another job as a nurse or as a, an admin staff or whatever. But then they just become part of this whole concealment project. And in the documentary strings attached, I did get to speak to one of their staff who managed to escape that lifestyle. And it, she was herself quite devastated by what had happened to her in Marie Stopes International. So this is it. They are concealing it. They are hiding the, a lot of the their services they do through the over the phone. They have toll-free lines and people can reach them in different countries. They also have 
incredible activity on social media. When you go to their Twitter page for some of the Maristos branches, it's incredible. They are posting things all the time. They are posting veiled messages that you can see. Anyone reading it would know these are abortion advertisements. These are abortion ads. We know it. It's very obvious. But, you know, they have a lot of ways of reaching young people and also word of mouth, of course, young people in universities and all that. One of the women I interviewed in the documentary was someone who knew about Marisa from her university. So it's word of mouth. It's the people who are working there who then become part of the whole illegal project. And then there is, you know, they have all all their hidden services, phone, internet, you know, the media, they're using everything possible. And they they continue to get on and get off that way. And because in most of these African countries, our law enforcement are very much stretched to the limit. They're very much, you know, under-equipped, under-funded. You know, they, they tell you they can't go around chasing Maristops. And even when they're reported, it's really very hard to get anything out of it because these people, these law enforcement agencies in African countries, they're already uh, stretched thin. So Maristops just keeps getting away with what they do. And the documentary was really an attempt to expose some of it, you know, not all of it, but quite a bit of what they do and how they operate. And I remember you had a number of recordings of the calls to that toll-free line in the film. Can you give us a sort of a sense of how those would go? Yeah. So I had gotten someone who, a friend of mine who lives in Kenya, and he also has friends in university. So these are young people and they had agreed to make calls on, you know, just to, for us to record calls. So we talked about it and they agreed to do it. And then they made the calls. And, the, you know, there was a call where one of the ladies, one of the young girls that we had got, she said she was pregnant and immediately Marie Soap staff was offering her abortion pills. They were offering to bring it to her house. They were offering to, you know, to post it. They were offering to send it to her by courier. <laughs> uh, you know, and what she's saying, my parents are going to be upset. This lady the, the Maristo staff was was really offering it to her like some sort of a, a marketing, a very fierce marketing strategy. And then there was another one where a guy had also phoned just so that we can cover everything we needed to also have a guy call to show that Maristo doesn't really care and much about women. This is a guy who said his girlfriend is pregnant, but that he's not ready. So it was not really about her. It was about him. And still on top of that, the Maristo staff was offering abortion to him. So there are these various scenarios where you would find that they have absolutely no checkpoints or no, there's, they just offer abortions and abortion pills, which again is illegal. And again, just for people to have bear this in mind that this is a British organization being highly funded by the British government and other Western governments doing this on African soil, doing this in African countries where they have laws and rule of law. So it's it's just the mind blowing stuff of, of mm. it that these organizations are operating as they do or they're operating as they want, but then they are foreign organizations. So surely there has to be, you know, some kind of bilateral thing that has been breached here. Cause you know, it's one thing that Planned Parenthood, for example, is doing all the terrible things they're doing in the United States, but it's another thing that it's a foreign organization coming in and doing that. So it's doubly offensive. It's doubly offensive. Mm -hmm. What kind of abortions are typically being performed at these places, given that they have to do it in a sort of undercover way? All of it. So, and that's again, again, one of the things exposed by the phone calls, because there was the one where they were offering the girl the pill because she had uh, said she was in very early stages of pregnancy. But the guy who had said that his girlfriend was about three months pregnant, she said, oh, yeah, we can do an operation. We can do a surgery. We can do a medical abortion. We, you know, the doctor will decide which one will be done. So they're really doing all of it. And how they get away with that, being able to run a, a complete service of surgical abortions, even in hidden conditions, is that they claim that they're doing post-abortion care. 
And post-abortion care, of course, as you know, is like when somebody has gone to have some kind of backstreet abortion and then they're in trouble or it's like an incomplete abortion. You come into a hospital, the hospital still has to save the woman's life by doing some sort of evacuation or what, you know, like a surgical procedure that mm. is like an abortion to finish up. So now when they do what they do, and even their staff, Marista staff have told me that when women come in for abortions, they sign papers you know, this kind of disclaimer to say that they've come in to do that. You know, they've come in for post-abortion care. But what they do is abortions. I mean, these are women who are coming for absolute complete abortions. And then they, in case someone catches them, they would just say they're finishing off something that was done elsewhere. And, you know, women who are already in vulnerable situations will agree to anything as long as this problem, which is their baby or their, you know, the crisis pregnancy, unexpected pregnancy, that someone will, quote unquote, remove it for them. So this is what Marie Stubbs has been doing. But I believe that their days are numbered. Why do you say that? Because we are right now just trying to get the word out. This documentary, Strings Attached, actually the first time when they've been exposed like this in such technicolor. We've known for many years what they've been doing, but it hasn't been very easy to get women who are willing to speak about their own abortions, knowing that it was illegal. And also people who have worked within that illegal system who were willing to come and speak you know, boldly in front of a camera. And that was the very fortunate and miraculous thing that happened mm. when I was gathering information for this documentary. So I've been trying to put the word out. We have presented this in various parliaments. I have shown it at the Canadian Parliament because Canada has been funding Marie Stokes since Justin Trudeau came into office. I have shown it at the British Parliament. I've shown part of it in the White House. I have shown the entire documentary at the Ugandan Parliament. So I've done a lot of parliamentary screenings. We've shown it in Vienna. We've done a lot of parliamentary screenings of this documentary. And the hope is that the members of parliament of various countries will begin to rise to say, you know, no more. The documentary is only a couple of months old. I'm hoping that more Africans will get to see it also and ask themselves, why is this organization even operating among us in any capacity? So in Nigeria last week, Marisov's clinic was actually raided, you know, for this same kind of thing where some people were saying, well, they're doing abortion. So they, you know, they went in and, and you know, a lot of, there was a kind of an altercation and, and then the police came in and raided them. I don't know what has happened because it's only a few days past when this has happened. But I'm hoping that in more and more African countries, there will be people taking more interest in knowing what Marie Stubbs does. Mm. Now, given the lack of oversight, I can't imagine that the conditions in these clinics is too good. No, it's not. As one can attest to it, even in Western countries where there is very close oversight, the Marie Stokes has still had a lot of problems in the UK, where in one particular three-month period in the United Kingdom, they had over 2,000 violations by the Commission for the Care Quality Commission here in the UK. But imagine what then happens in African nations. All the people who have worked for them, who have come out, have the same thing to say. It's the way they operate in Uganda, when I spoke to a staff who, this wasn't part of the documentary, but I had spoken to a staff of Maristo who came out, to, who told me that actually the abortions there in their Ugandan clinics are not being performed by doctors even. So they, in, mm -hmm. in Uganda, is being performed by medical, what they call medical assistants or medical officer. For you to be a medical officer, you just have to finish high school. So if they're not even nurses, they're just people trained to go in and remove babies from wombs. So so it's all kinds of terrible things and unbelievable things. And even when you go beyond abortion and you say, OK, maybe they're doing family planning and you look at their family planning practices, it's also very, very problematic. Again, that part of that part was captured in the documentary where we went to a Ugandan village and we spoke to so many women and these women had the same thing to say. It's Marie Sobs came to our village, gave us contraception in their mobile clinic and then went away and left us and we had you know, one of the women said she bled for more than a year every day of her life until she had it removed. Sometimes these women don't have easy access to doctors. So when they have any side effects, they don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. And meanwhile, they have an IUD stuck inside them because a lot of the methods that Marie Stokes uses in some of these African villages are like, like the ones that women can't get easily removed, right? They, they're implants, they are 
IUDs that they've inserted into the, into the uterus. So these women cannot just stop it or it's not a pill. It's not, they, they are giving them things that they, the women themselves are stuck with and the women are sterilized with in a sense of speaking. So even when we spoke to a doctor in, in that Ugandan village who runs a small clinic, he said that at one point in time, a woman you know, he saw this woman, she was dying of, nobody knew what was wrong with her. And then they did an x-ray and there they found an IUD inside her body that she had carried for about 10 years. IUDs are not meant to stay that long, you know, but this woman just, it was just there and she, it was rotting her womb, he said. So these are some of the horrible unethical things that would even fall into like human rights abuse possibly and Marie Stubbs is getting away with it because nobody no absolutely nobody is there to defend the women they cannot be sued they cannot be caught at what they do but the good thing is that these women always know who brought contraceptives to them even if they can't speak English everybody knows Marie Stubbs they can say who gave them this you know device or this IUD or whatever that has caused them all the problems. And they're using, aren't they using a lot of medications and technologies that are kind of rejected, not, rejected in, in Western countries? Absolutely. They absolutely are. They, there was a time they were given a lot of implants. What was it? The, the little one that you insert in the arm. And that particular device had been completely rejected. It had been removed out of the Western market. So much settlement had been made as well out of court settlement where women in the West who had used it, it was the no plant. People rejected no plant. No plant was withdrawn from market. The producers and manufacturers of no plant were giving women money in the, they paid more than something like $50 million in set out of court settlement to different women who had problems with it in the West. But at the time, or at that same time, and even years after they were still out there, Maristops were still out there in villages giving no plant to women. And these women really suffered it. But nobody, the difference is that no one came to, you know, give them anything out of court settlement because that's it. The Africans cannot complain and the Africans are never heard or they hardly ever heard. And that's really why I made the documentary, because I wanted the world for the first time to just hear these women's voices. Yeah, one can speculate about, you know, the motives of these people doing these things. And, you know, perhaps they believe they have good intentions or they believe they're helping. But the way in which they do it really shows their contempt for the people they're supposedly trying to help. It really shows their contempt for African yeah. nations and African women. Well, absolutely. People talk about racism all the time. And, you know, I live in the West now and I hear people talk about racism and I laugh and I say, no, the, the real racism happens in, in African countries. If you want to see real racism and people being treated like animals, you should go and see how reproductive rights organizations like International Planned Parenthood Federation, like Maristos International, you should see how they treat Africans. And the thing is that they get a lot of money in our name. So mind you, when all this donor money is given, that the donor money is given not directly to African institutions, but they are given to these Western NGOs who go into Africa and treat us like animals and, you know, tag us and, you know, sterilize people, abort babies and come out only to be wealthier by it. The CEO, the, the head of, of Maristops International here in London is getting almost half a million pounds a salary. The prime minister of the UK does not get half a million pounds in salary. He earns more than the prime minister. And why does he get that kind of money? Because he's running this organization that goes out and, you know, and sterilizes, you know, a lot of the developing world. This is where the true racism is. And in my book, Target Africa, I called it a uh, philanthropic racism and it's really truly mm. happening because they're not really listening to us they, they don't care that mind you as we started off talking today we talked about how genuinely pro-life the african people are they don't care about any of that they still go in and go against our cultural views and values and they do what they want to do and they go out and get a big paycheck for it mm. Now, I think you mentioned in the documentary or there was a staff member you spoke with who said that they were giving them bonuses to persuade more women to get abortions, weren't they? Yes, absolutely. So they and she wasn't the only one, as I said, a couple of years back to I had had this 
kind of informal interview with the Mary Stokes and staff, former staff who had worked in Uganda, same thing. They are operating in, they have the same marketing strategy where their staff convinced or their staff are trained to go out and get women or any woman who walks in for an abortion. They make sure they try to get her to have an abortion because abortion is their biggest revenue. So I had mentioned a bit earlier that when they do abortions, even in African countries, they get money. They, you know, they charge for it. They will tell you, this is how much it will cost to abort your baby. Sometimes these women are able to pay the entire thing. Some other times they're not. And from what one of their managers, the former managers told me is that even when women don't have enough money, they still will provide the abortion because then they turn around and through some voucher system, they still get that money back. Like it's almost like they can claim back the money from these various governments uh. Uh, yeah, you see. So that's what they do. That's why they need more numbers. So either they're getting money from the women, but also for every abortion they do, there is some sort of voucher system, you know, within, within the Maristos networks where they're able to go back and claim it back as development work. So abortion is a big business for them. It's a big source of revenue. And so they are getting bonuses for abortions. And in the UK, too, that has happened anyway. Right. Yeah, of course, that's not unknown to Western countries at all. Yeah. Now, a very positive development, and I can't remember what year this happened, but Marie Stopes International was actually just totally banned from Kenya, correct? When did that happen and how did that come about? Yeah, that happened last November. They Unfortunately, after a couple of weeks, they did a lot of PR work and then the suspension was removed. What happened was actually that they were caught out doing those adverts I told you about, the social media ads. So where the censorship board looked at some of the adverts and said to them, you know, abortion is not legal in Kenya. So why are you saying this on on Facebook? And why are you saying this on Twitter? Why are you advertising abortions? So there was this kind of back and forth between Maristos in Kenya and the head of the censorship board in Kenya. And then he struck out against them, which is, you know, rightly so. And they suspended them for a certain period of time and, and actually told them that they cannot provide any kind of abortion or abortion related thing or so for some time they were under very close watch by the medical and dentistry board in Kenya as I said that was last November and right now they're still operational in Kenya unfortunately but at least they are on very shaky grounds okay I see now Without going into too much detail, can you tell us a little bit about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and their role in this kind of dynamic with the African world? Yeah, so the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have done a lot of work in Africa, but back in 2012, they launched a whole new campaign, you know, under the leadership of Melinda Gates herself. It was something on contraception. She decided she's going to raise a lot of money. She's, you know, she rebranded the whole thing. So... They started putting in a lot of their money. They were already giving a lot of funding to family planning. Then they started giving even more to family planning. So they came out after maybe a year or two to say that their organization is not going to be funding abortions. They will only be funding contraceptives. The problematic thing about it is that Maristos International gets a lot of their funding too from the Gates Foundation. So what the Gates Foundation does is even though they say we don't... you know, we're not going to fund abortions, but they are still at this point in time, they are still giving so much funding to an organization like Mary Stokes International that they are giving them as much as several countries even put together. Right now, they're one of the highest donors and they're giving money to this organization. And as you know, as what has happened with, say, for example, Planned Parenthood Federation of America, where they say they're getting government funding, but it's not going to abortion. Well, money is always fungible. So if you give money to an abortion organization, even if you give it to them for you know, to buy paper or to buy printer or to build new offices, you've just given them money for abortions because the money can always move around. There is no real demarcation between their funds. The money goes to paying the abortionists, lobbying for abortions in African countries, for advocacy. They're still using this Bill and Melinda Gates money for abortions. Whether the Gates Foundation 
coming out for abortion or not, they're still one of the heaviest funders of abortions in Africa. And also in addition to that, the, obviously the Gates Foundation is giving directly and they mean to give directly to quote unquote family planning. So that's contraceptives. But that means that they are also partly the source of a lot of the contraceptive drugs and devices that have caused a lot of women damages across the different African countries for which these women can never, ever come back to them to, for reparation. So if someone's life has been destroyed, if someone is using it and gets a blood clot, a dangerous or life-threatening blood clot or something happens, there's no way the Gates Foundation will be held accountable. The Gates Foundation, in fact, as far as I know, has never, ever been held accountable or linked to anything you know, that has affected anybody's life in a bad way, even though, yes, if you trace it all, if yes, if women are, are having real serious, serious life-threatening problems with contraceptives, that invariably means that the Gates Foundation are responsible for some of those. So that's the role of the Gates Foundation. And again, in Strings Attached, I do show the connection between the Gates and some of these things that have happened within the African continent. Now, was it this action in 2012 by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, was it this that sort of got you involved in the work yes, that you do? Absolutely. So that's when I wrote the open letter to Melinda Gates, or what later became known as the open letter to Melinda Gates, because I, I couldn't believe the day she launched this project. I just couldn't believe what I was hearing, how she was going to put all this effort into this kind of massive project, which I knew as an African that women in Africa were not clamoring for it. There's, you know, there's no place you go and you see a huge movement of feminists or whatever who are clamoring for contraceptives. Are people using contraceptives in African countries? Yes. But then no one is out on the street saying that anybody owes them contraceptives or they want contraceptives because already a lot of the contraceptives coming to us are coming either as aid or as, you know, they're coming as highly subsidized by pharmaceutical agencies. So there are all these deals that are brokered on, on the heads of Africans to the point that we get a lot of contraceptives coming through our system. Them. So I just didn't understand why somebody was going to raise five billion to go out and, and get all that money, you know, for for African women when we have an axe for it. Meanwhile, when you look at something like education across the different African countries, there is a huge, huge gap with millions of millions of kids, especially African girls who are not in school, who should be in school. We have like almost a hundred million children across various African countries who are school aged and who legally should have been in school in any other part of the world, but they're just not in school. So they are already, in a way, they're already on the track for lifetime poverty. If you have a 14-year-old who has never been to school, who has never learned to read or write, already that child, unless something miraculous happens in their life, they're tracked for poverty for the rest of their lives. So I kept wondering, when we have this issue, and then, you know, all these things, if you someone is raising money and you say you want to empower women, why don't you go and, and speak to this particular issue that is a, a real, real problem on the continent. Mm. Now, you mentioned earlier that Marie Stopes and organizations like that are doing background work, lobbying, et cetera, to change public opinion about abortion and also to pressure governments to legalize abortion. Now, speaking about foreign aid from Western governments more generally, in other words, let's say that this aid is not specifically going for contraception or abortion. To what extent, you know, going along with the strings attached theme, to what extent is that money attached to pressure and a broader attempt to create a sexual revolution in Africa? As long as it's going to a productive type organization. So if it goes into the hands of International Planned Parenthood Federation, if it goes into the hands of Marie Stopes International, if it goes into the hands of an organization known as DKT International, if it goes to another one, the PSI, which is the Population Organization, or IPAS, which is this American organization that is very well known in various African countries, then you have automatically given money to pressure African nations to legalize abortion because these organizations there they are lobbying so even if you give them the money for as i said before even for like you know paper and stationery in their offices 
these organizations are there funding lobbyists who are there 365 days in a year and their sole purpose is to put pressure, you know, on African nations and African leaders to legalize abortion. It is actually a very serious problem because I've spoken to also to a lot of African politicians who wouldn't speak on camera, who keep telling me that these people are doing things like parties, you know, they're they're doing cocktails and all that, that pro-life people don't have enough money to do, but, you know, these reproductive rights organizations are doing things, gathering them for different meetings and all of that and taking them to fancy hotels and putting pressure on them. So I guess my question was more (laughs) aimed at if there, let's say, if there is money going directly to African governments, to what extent is that attached to, you know, we won't give you more aid unless you do X? Okay, so now I get what you mean. Now, this is a little bit more complex because within the, the bilateral relationships that individual African nations have with individual Western nations, it's never really so overt. So a country is relating to the United States. They just There's all this money flowing through. Where you see it is when it comes to like the LGBT issues. That's when Western nations draw the line and then they say, you know, if you, you know, if you don't do this, we're not, we're going to withdraw our aid on this and that and the other. But also there have been times, say, for example, when there was a very strong retaliation because President Donald Trump came into office in 2017. And one of the first things he did, thank God, was to reinstate the Mexico City policy. So there was all this chain reaction that happened, especially among European countries and other Western nations, where they were, you know, screaming and saying how terrible the American government has become to take away funding for women's rights. But really, that money was money for abortion. So a country, one of the Western countries or one of the European countries actually sent off, made a new policy and said, if an organization, if any organization decides to change their policy to not provide abortion or to remove abortion out of their business in order to be able to qualify for American funding, they will remove funding. Does that make sense? So they were saying to NGOs who were out there who had some association with abortion, but who also were eager to get their hands on American funding. But those organizations, some of them were thinking of compromising. Now, this country was saying, I think it was Denmark, was saying to them, if you dare remove abortion or abortion-related things from your service, then we're going to take away funding from you. So they are doing it through third parties. Sometimes it's not, it doesn't, look very nice when you come out and say directly to Africans. Another way that Western countries are having direct or sort of indirect influence on abortion issues in Africa is through the United Nations, again, which is really a third party. So they don't go directly to an African country to say legalize abortion, but they go to the UN and the UN sets up these uh, informal, let's just call them informal commissions, you know, that bear the mark of the United Nations. But really, it's just a bunch of people, you know, it's just a bunch of activists who gather together under the name of the UN. And they do some kind of inquiry and say, actually, this country, Nigeria, you know, is not treating women well, or it's abusing women because of this, that and the other, and they always had abortion. In fact, this was one of the things that they did to the Republic of Ireland, that at the beginning, of of the whole conversation about legalizing abortion. There was a very strong statement that came out from a UN commission that said that they recommend abortion to be legalized. So they've done a lot of that with African countries. If they did it to, to Ireland, you must know that they've done a lot of it for African nations. So this is where you see a lot of the strong influence of Western countries. So they concentrate on the UN and UN type agencies Sometimes it's from the EU. You know, people gather together and they release some sort of resolution or document and say, oh, this African country, you have very high maternal mortality rates. This is what must happen in your country. You have to legalize abortion. So they've given us a lot of ultimatums like this. Thank God it hasn't worked. But the problem is that they're stacking up. They're stacking up all the time. And every time someone within an African parliament wants to bring up a case for abortion, there's always some UN recommendation or some UN kind of commission that will have the name of their country listed and will have to legalize abortion as part of the recommendation. 
Yeah, it's really what what you said about Denmark, or maybe it wasn't Denmark, whatever country it was. It's very disturbing. And it just, you know, I'm sure some of these people think that they're doing something good. But there's just also the inescapable aspect of when you're that deep in evil worldview, at a certain point, it's like you can't even stand that somebody else is out there not doing the same thing. It's like the existence. I mean, this is very much all through the, you know, the Old Testament about how the, you know, the existence of the, the righteous man is like a, yeah. you know, a slap into the face to the unjust. And it, and it's just exactly. and it's just amazing. And so, so demonic how it's like anywhere in the world that yeah. doesn't think and act the way we do and doesn't have abortion. It's like it's like if you don't provide for abortion, then we're not even going to allow you to do anything else good for these countries. Well, absolutely. So it's actually the country I've just checked in now because I wrote about it in my book, Target Africa, is Sweden. Sweden had, had said very clearly that they're going to take away money from any organization that kind of adjusts. But you're absolutely right. So I say to people all the time, how you know this is quite a diabolical thing is that, now think of African nations, there's so many African countries, everybody has different trade practices, everybody has different education type practices. So there are all these policies that are so different in our various countries, but nobody bothers us about it. So if we want, we can do our trade how we want. Our immigration policies within the various African countries are different. We have all these various policies, our financial institutions that are organized differently from country to country. Some of them, you know, are much more difficult. Some of them are are, are harder for people to thrive. Some of them are not even allowing businesses to thrive. Some are, are better suited for business. So there are various conditions, in other words. And no one cares. Nobody ever comes to us at the United Nations to say, don't you think you should do your trade differently? Don't you think you should give more freedom to, you know, people who want to do certain types of business and give them maybe more free market allowances and things like that? No one cares and no one talks to us about those things. No one does any of those recommendations for us. No one convenes an emergency commission at the United Nations because Nigeria has all of a sudden blocked up some free trade thing. But what happens whenever they think about us not having abortion is that they they feel like it's an indictment to them. So when you're doing something really evil, you set up this thing where it's like abortion, they've originally branded it as, yeah, let every country do their own thing. It's no one's business. Let's just do our thing. Let's have our Roe v. Wade. It doesn't concern anybody. It's just us. It's the American thing. It's let's do it within our country. And then it goes from being that to now we, we need uh, you know, we need Nigeria to do the same. You know, you have a you have a, an organization like the Center for Reproductive Rights, which is based in New York, is headquartered in New York, and yet this organization is out there in African countries fighting in court. You know, carrying out a whole judicial activism on African health agencies and health ministries, how telling us how we haven't legalized abortion, suing in the name of people. You know, they'll say this person went to have an legal abortion and the the, the child died. So this is what happens. So they sue us and they try to rope us in, but they don't care about anything else. As I said, they don't care whether girls go to school, whether we have 96 million African children out of school. No one is doing an emergency thing because these are real emergencies. I think we were being, you know, already tracked for, for, widespread poverty, widespread unemployment, and even unemployability if you have so many people within your populations who are not adequately educated. But once it comes to abortion, it's like they can't stand it. We have to have as much abortions and we have to see abortions in exactly the same way as they've set it up. You mentioned the Mexico City policy, and not only did President Trump reinstate that policy, but it was actually expanded significantly. Yes, It was originally covered about $600 million in family planning money, and now it applies to all international health care aid given by the U.S. government, which is almost $9 billion. So this is a really significant move because, you know, people would always say, well, you know, changing the Mexico City policy isn't that much of a big deal because you can just sort of count on a Republican president to do that and a Democratic president to do the opposite, regardless of whether they bother to do anything else about abortion. But this is a significant expansion, so it's a very good thing. Absolutely. Okay, so there's a more general debate about the 
efficacy of foreign aid as a development model among economists and and people like that. But aside from that debate, let's let's assume it is a good thing in general. Under these circumstances, is it a good idea for African countries to accept foreign aid from the the West at all, or do some of them really have no choice? Okay, so in full disclosure, I'm actually against aid for so many reasons because I've done a lot of study on it and I've done a lot of research on it and even a whole seg- I mean, several several chapters in my book, Target Africa, I actually go down to the economics of aid and how it is not working. It just seems not to be working. And that's not uh, actually think- a very controversial position uh, at this point. Yeah. I mean, I think that in the past decades, that's been pretty widely recognized. Yes, I mean, economists, as far back as the early 1970s, like uh, the economist uh, Professor Bauer, who was writing here in the United Kingdom, I think it was 1974, 75, he explained how terrible aid was. He said it's not going to work. And (laughs) that's like, you know, 45 years ago. And what he predicted and what he said, and this was about Africa, mind you, is is exactly right. So people have written it and has nothing to do with pro-life values or pro-life views. But those who know and those who have done the who have done the, the actual work and study on it would show you how it absolutely defeats the aim. When aid, there are several things in fact, when a lot of aid is given to a nation, say like a poor country, most times the money goes directly through government agencies in those countries, as one would expect it goes, but then it ends up really in the hands of the few government officials who are in charge in countries where there is very little oversight where there's very little accountability or no accountability, no transparency within how government is run, then it, what you then end up having are all these authoritarians in various parts of Africa who are wealthier than the, you know, than the Count of Monte Cristo, if you like. I mean, these people have so much wealth. And where has the wealth come from? The wealth has really come from a lot of the donor money. So it kind of seeps into their pockets and they, they manage to buy for themselves leadership forever. So they, they just don't go and they're changing constitution they, to make sure that their leadership continues and they, they don't ever have to step down. Uh, it has affected many African countries. It has kept many people in poverty. It hasn't seeped down to the populations. There are some other countries too that have also developed a really unhealthy relationship with aid. So for example, a country like Malawi has about 40% of its national budget dependent on aid. So there was a particular year, only a few years ago when they had these difficulties and problems with their donors and donors took away some funding. The country almost went into a complete economic collapse because they couldn't, there was no way they could deal with their budget if 40% of it, you are dependent on it to come from somewhere else. So aid has popularized the people. It has popularized the people that it, it purported to help, if you if you like. So this is a promise that it's going to bring people out of poverty, but instead it shackles them further, uh, kind of a an aid addiction in various African countries. So I'm very much against aid, but where we are right now is like having an addict. There is no way we can go cold turkey and come off of aid by say 2020, which is only next year. But we can have, if we're serious about really becoming healthier, independent countries in Africa, what we can do is to have a very common sense roadmap to a common sense and realistic roadmap uh, to coming off of aid. And that means that we should then start receiving or at telling donors that we want less aid than we got last year. So they have to win us of it gradually, but over a given period of time within the foreseeable future so that we get to a day when it's now zero aid. But that's not even happening. Our donors keep giving us money, even when they see despots, even when they see authoritarians, even when they see that it's not really working, they're still feeding the beast. And it continues to go on and on. And of course, once you don't add the whole ideology into to it where there's all these things like LGBT issues, abortion, contraception, sexuality, education, just things that are very poisonous to our own system. Then you find that a donor enjoys their position of power because they always have a bargaining chip. Are there any precedents in any country or in the world of a country deciding on its own initiative that we want less aid? Has that actually happened? 
Yes. So there are actually a few countries. The Ghanaian president has spoken out quite strongly against aid. Whether he has gone ahead to do anything because he's only a new, fairly new president. I think he's only been there about two and a half years. So, but he has given speeches where for the first time ever I heard an African president say, this is bad for us. What we need is business and investment and not aid and handouts. So it's really, it was quite startling, in fact, because all our leaders are so quiet about it, obviously because they're enjoying it. They don't even talk about aid. It's like they don't acknowledge it. But you look at all the figures and you can see this number of millions. In fact, about $50 billion flows into Africa every year under the auspices of aid. So, yeah, so there's a Ghanaian president who spoke out against it and who spoke out about it, whether he's done anything or not. I don't know. Then there is also Botswana, which even though they haven't talked much about it, they're a very tiny country, but I see on the aid chart, they're getting so very little. And they are a country that has had very high transparency. They're having a lot of self-improvement. They work so hard Mm -hmm. and there are all these great things coming from it. And there's a lot of accountability. They're really, you know, trying to kind of recreate themselves into this very exemplary African nation, if you like. So Botswana is, even though they're still on aid, but they're taking less aid, you know, they're just taking as little as you you can see, they're taking very little aid. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. I'm sort of curious about what the president of Rwanda is doing, because he's the only African president I really know anything about. I know he has liberalized the economy significantly. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Paul Kagame has done a lot of good work. And of course, as people know, he came in just at the end. He was part of the people, who, the revolutionaries who came in right at the point when the genocide was ending. And, you know, he, he helped at the end to fight the very last battle. So he's been sitting there. But the problem is that Paul Kagame has also been president since 1996. If you do the mathematics, that's a very, very long time. <laughs> uh, he's... <laughs> And, you know, and, and he has also, you know, like many of the other African leaders, there are all these disturbing things where some of the political opponents during elections kind of end up in prison. You know, there are all these things that people have raised eyebrows at, but uh, right. Rwanda has really been recreated again, just like Botswana into this exemplary country. They do have a higher transparency than most other African countries. They are having so many good things happen within their economy. They're having a lot of people thriving. Businesses are doing well. So the country itself has gone far from where it was from even like before the days of the genocide. So he's very much loved. I think he's a man that has gone so far and stayed this long, partly on the fact that he came in with people loving him. You see that he has a lot of capital there where there's much love and there's much goodwill towards him, both from his own country and and outside. But again, 1996, (laughs) uh, that means... (laughs) It makes me think of the situation in certain Eastern European countries as well. Yeah, Yeah. so he's, he's been there a while and people are beginning to question, you know, how much longer or he's one of the longer lasting presidents or head of states in Africa. I see. So it seems though the audience for this film is not necessarily just people who are already, you know, diehard pro-lifers and in that, in that the emphasis, as I said at the beginning, was more on the women than on the morality of abortions per se, yes. more on the ideological colonization and the experience of the women and things like that. Yes, it's really on the theme of neocolonialism. And I do say it in the documentary from the get-go. So Again, it's just to show you how big the West is looming over Africa when it comes to ideology. Of course, yes, there are all the the nitty gritty of abortion and the rightness and wrongness of it. But the bigger, bigger story and the bigger picture here is really should these people have this amount of say in African countries, especially where people are against these things. It's not like these are things that we are already used to or we don't have our own views on them. But these are things that are exactly opposed to our views and they're pushing it still. So I'm hoping that people can see it across the board. And also the fact that a lot of people I speak to in the West don't actually recognize or realize that they are very much a part of this whole, you know, this whole game of neocolonialism being 
played out in Africa. And why I say this is that as long as you're a taxpayer in the United States, as long as you're a taxpayer in the United Kingdom or any other country in the West, very much so you are a part of it, even though you're not cooperating, but but you are a part of it because government, all these government agencies are, are in cahoots with the reproductive rights organizations and they are still pushing what they're pushing in Africa. How can people see the film? It's very easy. It's just the documentary is available on Amazon.com. So you can just search for strings attached. Okay, strings attached. And when you see it, I think you would know because it has the continent of Africa. The poster is very much easy to, to recognize. So you can also see it on Vimeo On Demand. But the easiest place, if you forget any of these, is to go to stringsattachedfilm.com. Stringsattachedfilm.com and just follow the prompts. And just watch the film online. We put all the links there so that people can see it. You can stream it. You can rent it. But also just tell people about it and let people watch. And especially people who are your relatives who are not very pro-life, but they say they love the black people and they love <laughs> Africans and all that. Yeah, you should get them to see it, actually, because it's the one thing I think is the one way you can talk to them about abortion is for them to see that abortion actually feeds into this whole tyranny between Western nations and less developed countries and, and poorer countries. And if people check out the book Target Africa, that would give more of a big picture Absolutely. And there's a lot of research in it. There's a lot of footnotes. It was published by Ignatius Press. So it's very well done. So Target Africa is available on Amazon. And you have a podcast now as well, don't you? I do have a podcast, but it's mostly actually it's a YouTube video, which we then put on podcasts for to, just for it to be easy for people to, to listen to. But it's Connect the Dots with Obiano Ju which is easily found on YouTube. But you can also see some of it if you follow me on Twitter, because every time I post anything, I, you know, it's easy. Once I post something, you, you can I put a link to the YouTube video. Now, one last question. What do yes. you do when you're not working on these foreign aid issues? Oh, I work full time as a biomedical scientist. I'm a specialist biomedical scientist in the UK. So I work in the area of hematology and blood transfusion. And that's it. So I work, I've taken a full time night shift contract. So in the night, I work as a scientist. In the day, I work as a pro-life activist. And that is a charmed life. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get, don't ask me when I sleep, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Iji, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a pleasure. Thank God bless you. Promise. Thank you and God bless. For links to Obianuju's book, her podcast, her documentary, and other resources, please go to the show notes page at catholicculture.org slash episode 41. I've got a couple of little excerpts from Plato on beauty and art to share with you today. The first is from his dialogue, The Phaedo. I think that if there is anything beautiful besides the beautiful itself... It is beautiful for no other reason than that it shares in the beautiful, and I say so with everything. I no longer understand or recognize those other sophisticated causes, and if someone tells me that a thing is beautiful because it has a bright color or shape or any such thing, I ignore these other reasons, for all these confuse me. But I simply naively and perhaps foolishly cling to this, that nothing else makes it beautiful other than the presence of or the sharing in or however you may describe its relationship to that beautiful we mentioned, for I will not insist on the precise nature of the relationship, but that all beautiful things are beautiful by the beautiful. Second passage is from his dialogue, The Phaedrus. If anyone comes to the gates of poetry and expects to become an adequate poet by acquiring expert knowledge of the subject without the muse's madness, he will fail, and his self-controlled verses will be eclipsed by the poetry of men who have been driven out of their minds. All right, that's it for today. God bless you, and see you next week.